We went up with our family, and I spent the weekend with them. And have, how many of y'all have been to Islands of Adventure or Universal lately? Anybody? They have this Velociraptor roller coaster ride that it's a mistake. Like, it, it really is. And my, my family was like, we rode on it before, and it was so scary. And I was like, whatever. It's, our, it's a roller coaster. How bad can it be? And we went on that thing, and I... I was making deals with the Lord, like, on the ride. It was terrible. I was, uh, please, 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 please. You know, I, got, I got really brave at one point, and I put my hands up, and then I was, like, wrapped around the thing for the picture. I looked terrible. But I really enjoyed myself uh, when I was up there. And I spent the weekend with my family, and I really felt compelled to talk about humility today because of that. Right? And I'm just like, <laughs> that, that's them in the front laughing. Um, so, uh, but honestly, I have a uh, message on humility, and I feel like it's something that we don't speak on very often, because it's, a, it's kind of a weird topic to encourage people. You're like, I really want you to dig in deep and be humble and tell people about it this week, right? Like, I really want you to dig in deep and realize how much you don't have it. Like, it's, it's a weird topic, and I remember... Um, I, I've kind of shied away from it until I had this aha moment, this realization of what humility in the Lord is and what it looks like in my life. And so I want to share that with you because it was freeing for me. Father, I thank you for what you're going to do here today. I thank you for giving me this word to be able to preach it and teach it. And I pray that you would just anoint me, anoint my lips right now in this moment and so that I can say exactly what I need to and soften hearts and ears so that they can get everything they need and that lives will be changed today. In Jesus' name, amen. So that aha moment. Have you ever had something that like you said it wrong for years or like a song, you sang it wrong for years? And then, one, then you hear it and you're like, well, yeah, I guess they aren't saying things about llamas in that song. It doesn't even make any sense, right? I had that with uh, my family. We're from Louisiana, and there's, uh, how many of y'all know what you call the thing that's a dresser? But there's a different word for it. No, no, it's a uh, chest of drawers. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Joe's with me. For my entire life growing up, I called that Chester Drawers. <laughs> Until I saw something online. My sister sent it to you. She's like, did you, to me, she was like, did you know that this is tre- Chest of Drawers? I was like, that makes so much sense. I was like, who is Chester anyway? It doesn't even make sense. I don't. That's how I stand on, my, <laughs> on this word that I'm bringing. Um, and I, the thing is about humility is that there are so many promises that are tied to the truth that is humility in the Lord. And I feel like it's something that we should really spend some time on. I'm going to read a couple of scriptures. In Proverbs 18, 12, it says, Before his downfall, a person's heart is proud, but humility comes before honor. It says that we are, scripture says that we, um, that we, he will bless those who have humble and contrite hearts. That if he, uh, he gives grace to the humble, he who humbles himself will be exalted. It's a common theme throughout all scripture. It says that we're supposed to dress ourselves in humility. And not only that, in Micah 6, 8, the Lord actually requires us. It says, mankind, he has told each of you what is good and what is the Lord requires of you. And it says to ask, act justly, to love faith, uh, faithfully to love faithfulness, and to walk humbly with your God. It's a, uh, it's a requirement for us. I think it's an important topic for us to be hitting on today. But like I said, I've always had some confusion with this because I also know that we're supposed to be bold as a lion, right? The righteous were bold as lions. The wicked, they flee from nothing. That we are supposed to st- stand firmly and boldly. And it's an awkward thing because I don't think of those two things. Maybe I'm, I'm odd here, but I don't think of those two things in the same sentence. Like, be humble and be bold. I'm like, I don't, I'm not too sure what you want, want me to do. Well, how you want me to respond to that. I'm, uh, and so uh, if you would, just turn with me to Numbers 13. We're gonna read, I'm going to go through and paraphrase some and flow through, but we'll be in Numbers 13, chapter 13, and chapter 14. And we're talking about the uh, spies that go into, uh, the 12 spies from the children of Israel that go into the promised land. How many of y'all are familiar with that story? 
that you had 12 spies go out and they do all these things and they're like, they come back and they say, you know what? Everything is good. Everything is what you want it to be. Everything has the fruit the, um, are, uh, is amazing. It really is flowing with milk and honey. Love my family. All right, and so here's the uh, 10 spies. They come back. They says, we went into the land which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruits. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there, and the Amalekites lived through Negev, and the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. And then this is the report that they give. And then Caleb comes in and Caleb silences the people. He says, Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. And then you come back to the 10 spies who say, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. I'm reading it. I'm just keeping the conversations going. I'm skipping all the uh, details in between. This is, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about, report about the land they had explored. Ten spies speaking again, still. They say, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are great in size. We saw the Nephilim there. We seemed uh, like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. There is such a contrast in report here from the two. You have 10 spies coming out and saying, this is insane. And Caleb says, surely we can take it. Now, what I've realized is in the church, what would happen in this moment, imagine that you were supposed to go do something and all these bad reports came in from the 10 people. And then the one person said, no, we should do this. How do you think we would probably respond? We'd probably be like, thank you guys for being so wise, for using your wisdom. Thank you guys for giving us this report. You're right. We were looking for something too big. We were trying to take on something that's a little bit too much. Yeah, am I the only one that feels that way? That a whole lot of times when the majority says something, we're like, you know what? We need to stand back and use wisdom in this moment. I do not want to do that. And so what's happening here is all of the people that they're reporting to, they're talking to Moses at this point, and then there's some other people that they're looking and they're saying, you know what? I am so glad that they, didn't, they weren't as prideful as what Caleb was. Right? Y'all follow me? That, that, man, could he really get that? Like, him saying that it would be so easy and that we would be able to possess it, that's a moment of pride, and you need to check your spirit on it. And then the other ten, they're probably congratulating him. They're saying, thank you for thinking this through so well. Thank you for stepping out so well. Thank you for being there and saying, you know what? Well, let's just use our wisdom and our thoughts here. The difference between these two people, these two groups of people, in my opinion, is that one of them was focused on heaven and the other one was not. The ten spies weren't focused on heaven. Caleb was. And this is the understanding of biblical humility that I have come to grasp, is that it's whenever people are looking at things under their own strength and their own ability is whenever they are able to step, they stand, whenever they're uh, putting their place, them in the place of the Lord when he's calling them to act out, is when people are actually being the most prideful in their walks. Whenever you start saying, you know what, I'm going to take, I can't do that without realizing that you never could do it before on your own. It's when you start stepping into some stuff and you're saying, you know what, I, I don't have the ability to do this. Rather than looking at every problem and saying, how am I going to figure that out? I believe that's a point of pride in our lives. Rather than saying, you know what, the Lord is going to give this land to us as we're called to go into it. Y'all follow me? And then you have Joshua and then you, uh, that comes out. Uh, beginning of chapter 14 comes through and it just begins with a whole bunch of whining from the children of Israel. And uh, it says, Joshua and Caleb uh, said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. The Lord is pleased with us. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. 
Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. Joshua and Caleb in this scenario are the humble ones because they never once put it on their own shoulders to do what the Lord had called them to do. You had this group of, imagine this group of uh, the Israelites at this point, all of the things that they had seen. All of the miracles, the water uh, splitting apart, uh, all, the, um, the, all the plagues that came through, all these things that the Lord did to deliver them. And somehow in this moment, somehow whenever they get to the land, the place that they are supposed to go, they say, you know what, we're not going to be able to do this when the Lord had been doing it the whole time. Can somebody relate to that? That you get to a point and sometimes you just uh, begin to operate in the natural for a moment. And you're like, what was I thinking trying to do that? Why would I go out into, well, it doesn't even make any sense to, for me to be able to do that. I mean, I'm still, I still got some things in my life that I'm struggling with. Oh, it doesn't make any sense. Why would I make that investment? I mean, I don't even have, I don't have enough in my bank account. I, I can't really give out like that. I can't give to other people. I can't step out in faith. Like it was on you from any point in your life at all. I got a few people that understand what I'm saying here. The difference between humility in these two is not the fact what they said they could do or how they could say uh, what they said about it. It was that their view was, was can I do it or can I lo the Lord do it? Whenever they were stepping into something. If you are living your life in a way that you aren't being stretched in your faith... I don't believe that you're using your faith the way that it was intended to. I believe that we cannot possess a land. We cannot, we're not called to do things that we're able to do on our own ability. That the Lord calls us to do exceedingly and abundantly. That he calls us into places and situations where we have to depend on him. Because if you don't have to depend on him, oftentimes we just rely on us. Another great example of the, the wise versus the humble in the view of the world versus the view of uh, the kingdom mindset, like I was saying. Kingdom mindset being the Lord can do it. The worldly mindset said we can't do it without realizing that the Lord was going to do it all along. Is a scripture, is a story that we are all pretty well familiar with, with David and Goliath which I love, love, love this. Oh, I forgot to say that the, right after this uh, uh, Joshua says this. Do y'all remember what the response was from the Israelite community? In verse uh, chapter 14, verse 6, it says, But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. I've always, I, it always makes me laugh every time that I read that. Your biblical understanding of humility is important because if you don't st walk humbly before the Lord, if you do not... Um, if you do not humble yourselves, which it says that we humble ourselves. So it's on us to keep that mindset going, a kingdom mindset where we focus on the Lord. That if we don't do it, a lot of times we will keep ourselves, we will keep other people from pursuing the things that the Lord has for them. And I want, I want you to grab a hold of that. I don't ever want to not walk humbly before the Lord because I can literally keep other people from pursuing the things that they want to and think that I am doing them a favor by not having them step out. All, the entire group there, the whole Israel community, uh, it's uh, in verse 10. It says, Then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the Israelites. The Lord said to Moses, How long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the signs I have performed among them? And then I'm jump ahead to verse 22. That In between that, Moses and the Lord are arguing back and forth on how to handle it. And it says that, not one of those who saw my glory in the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times. Not one of them will ever see the land I promised on an oath to their ancestors. No one has treated me with contempt will ever see it. And as you know, the whole generation had to die off before they took that land. If you would jump with me to 1 Samuel verse 17, verses 8 through 16. You have Goliath standing there, and he's shouting out all of these insults. He comes out. So we have 
the Philistine army and we have the Israelites that are standing there and they are at an impasse. They line up, the soldiers line up together and they're basically just staring down before a battle. And what has begun to happen is Goliath comes out and he says, you know, I am just one man. He's like, if any of you among you can come and defeat me, we will all be your slaves. Right, And then he's laughing, and he's taunting, and he's saying all this stuff. And it continually says in the scripture that all, everyone was afraid that was there. And then you have this guy, David, this kid, David, that comes up. And he, uh, his, his uh, dad sends him with some grains and some cheese for one of the sergeants there. And he comes out, and it says, uh, now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to, def uh, to defy Israel. The king will, will give great wealth to the man who kills him. And then David starts paying attention right here. He says, he also will give his daughter in marriage, and he will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. David heard the thing about taxes and was like, can you, can you say this to me again? It says, David asked the man, the very next verse, the man standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes the disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that should defy the armies of the living God? He gets verified what it is. And then when uh, Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and says, Why have you come down here? And, who, and with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. And, and you came down only to watch the battle. Again, this is a moment that is a difference between a kingdom mindset and an earthly one. Because according to the world, and we'll see it with Saul in a second, according to Eliab, the ones that are wise are the ones that are cowering in fear away from what they were supposed to do in the first place. Is when, when Goliath stood up and defied the Israel, Israel, uh, Israelites, defied Israel, I believe that there were plenty of people that the Lord asked to stand up in that army that decided to cower in fear because they said they looked at the natural and said, you know what, there is no way I'm going to be able to beat this behemoth of a man. They, they had reports like what Saul says in a second. He says, he says, you know, you're just a boy. He has been a warrior since he was your age and he's twice your size. It doesn't make any sense for you to go out there. You'll have people around that are around you in your life that are going to say, no, 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 no. And oftentimes where it hurts the most is it's the people that are the closest to you that tell you, you know what? I don't think that you're supposed to do that. I don't think you're called to that. You say, who do you think you are? Why don't you just go back to your sheep instead of trying to shake things up a little bit? Y'all ever encountered that where you, where you really were excited about something? So you share it with the people closest to you and they're like, What? Why would you do that? And in that moment, it's really important to remember who the Lord is and to keep your eyes on him because, again, they're right. You probably can't do it, and that's why the Lord's calling you to depend on him to do it. So here David is, and he responds. He says, now what have I done? Can't I even speak? He then turned away before someone else and brought up the same matter, and the men answered him as before. Their reactions were supposed to stifle David, but his heart wouldn't let him. And you know, actually, that's something that I love. You know, there's little things, there's certain passages in scriptures that I pursue with my life, and one of them is that I love that the Lord said David was a man after his own heart. Right? That is something, I mean, I want that for my life. I want that to be the pursuit of my life. I want to be a man after the Lord's own heart. And I think that the way you do it is that you always keep your eyes on the Lord in every area of your life, no matter what it is or no matter what it looks like. No matter what's happening around you. You got people uh, questioning every step, every move that you make. If you try to step out a little bit more, people are going to be like, why do you think you can do that? What, weren't you just now struggling with this? What, what, what happened? What, why, what makes you think, you think that you should be able to lead people, that you should be able to direct people? Why do you think that you can speak and speak out against these things? 
They're like, you just struggled with that thing. And I was like, that's why I can speak out against it. That's why I can speak about it, because the Lord showed me how graceful and how faithful that he is by putting me in a position to be able to reach other people. A lot of times you are called to pull up people that were, went through the exact same things that you did. And the Lord finds a way to just send them your way. That when people oftentimes in your life get jumbled up the exact same way that you did, and it's your ability, it's you being able to call out and say, you know what, I struggle with that same thing. But God helped me through it. God pushed me through it. can be the difference between someone. I was thinking today, you know, I've had several instances in my life where I was, um, had something financial come up or as something that got in my way. And I was like, you know what? I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to do it. And then like someone randomly will just give me money or give me a check or a check will show up out of nowhere. And it happens over and over. It's actually getting really fun at this point. It's because I'll step out in faith in a way and I'll be like, I don't know. I do the same thing over and over. Like, I don't know if I was supposed to do that. I'm not too sure. And then someone will just show up and meet the need that's there. And it's really, really cool. And I love it. I was thinking today, though, uh, about how many times was there ever time in my life where I was called to meet that need for somebody, and I didn't do it. And so they didn't get to see the faithfulness in that moment of the Lord. That whenever I was supposed to step up to meet a need in my community, or I was supposed to step up right there in a moment financially, or I was supposed to step up and help somebody with a ride somewhere, or, or whatever it might be, that they were actually asking the Lord for it, and the Lord put it on me to do it, and it had to go to somebody else, because I didn't step into it. I was on the way to church just thinking about this over and over, and it was just weighing on me heavy that, you know, I don't want someone else to do the things that I'm supposed to do for the Lord, I don't want uh, someone else having to step out because the Lord will, it's a next man up. It really is. That person will take on what they're supposed to do and what you were supposed to do. And the Lord will show up huge in their lives. You look at Elijah and Elisha. They had different calls in their life. And Elisha had to take on the anointing of Elijah. They had to take his cloak. He had to handle his business and what he was supposed to. There was actually three people that stood up for that one to be able to handle it. It will get filled, and I just don't want to live a life where I have to question whether or not my destiny is going to get filled by somebody else. I don't want to live in a life where I have a fear of, and the way you do that is you keep it focused on the Lord no matter what. You look at Moses. Mo I've always laughed at Moses' writing. He said, I am the humblest of all men on the earth. He literally wrote that himself. It's in parentheses. I don't know why it was in parentheses, but he literally wrote it. And I was like, man, I don't know how you can say that. that that's why my message is humble like me. I was like, you, I don't think that's okay for you to, right? That's weird. But the truth is, is that Moses figured out a long time ago that it had nothing to do with him. That he just so happened to grab a staff and run into a bush. And the Lord used him in a mighty and magnificent way. That Moses never had the ability, he had a speech impediment. He never had the ability to speak and to lead these people, but the Lord showed up over and over and over again where it was almost getting comical for him. He was like, Lord, you did it again. How are you going to do it this time? How are you going to do it this time? He had the revelation that he had nothing to do with it. And this is how I know that... Um, that David was not prideful. In fact, that, that he was extremely humble was because in verse 37, he responds in a way to Saul that shows his true heart and who he was. It says, The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Phil Philistine. And this is where he uh, encourages Paul, I mean Saul. It says, Saul said to David, Go and the Lord be with you. He caught a hold of what the, he, David was talking about. David could have very easily started defending who he was. He could have very easily just started defending the things that he had done. But he doesn't. He doesn't say, you know what? You hadn't heard about David, right? You haven't heard about that bear that came at me and I killed him, right? That lion that came at you. You haven't heard about what I can do. I got this. He doesn't say that at all. He says, I got, I've been in worse things than this, and the Lord showed up, and he'll do it again. 
He said, the, the paw of the lion and the bear, the Lord delivered me. The Lord delivered me, and the Lord is going to deliver me again. That's how I know that the David is humble is because he says, again, it has nothing to do with me. The Lord is just amazing. I know I can't win this battle, but he can because it's already won. This is something that I had to grab a hold of. When I first launched into youth ministry, and I was sharing this with Joe at the men's group on Monday, that there was something that, uh, I, there was this big event that I put together. And I was like seeing it in my mind. I was like, this is going to be so cool. They're going to bring all these people. We had this huge illustrated sermon that we were going to do. I was like, people are going to get free. They're going to get set free. It's going to be awesome. And then I went up and I preached and started teaching. And it was like crickets in there. Like it was nothing. They were falling asleep. And it was terrible. The whole thing sucked. It just did. <laughs> no way around it. And I was like, oh, man. Like, you know, I was like so devastated. I'm not. Uh, like the whole week I was down, I was out. I was like, I can't believe that. I saw it going so good, and it went so bad. <laughs> Stuff just fell through and fell through and fell through over and over, and you're like, oh, man. And it actually carried over into me the next week. And so I didn't have, um, I, I just, I was having difficulty writing my message. And so I was just praying. So I just began praying and praying, and there was, like, no message. I couldn't put a message together. And I don't know if I was stifled or just the Lord was trying to teach me something in this moment because I, I just prayed. I prayed some more, and I prayed some more. And then I went up on stage, and I gave this 10-minute message that I felt like I was just making it up on the spot. But the Lord was giving me the words, and uh, I did a quick altar call. I got nervous. I was like, bow your heads, close your eyes. <laughs> We're done. And whenever I did that, I did the, the entire youth group stood up and came to the front and started, came to the altar and started worshiping. And people got set free that night, the night that I didn't do anything for the message, the night that I didn't do a big illustration, that I didn't do anything. And it's in that moment that I realized that I really don't have too much to do with this, that the only reason that I'm here is because the Lord anointed me to speak to you today. And the only reason that I'm here is because I said, okay, I'll, I'll try, Lord. I'll, I'll do it because you're calling me to it. But it really has nothing to do with me, myself. It has everything to do with the Lord moving. People get set free and get, uh, get the Lord in their hearts because he calls on their heart, that he knocks on the door. He's sitting there waiting. One of my uh, best friends that I grew up with, I, I, um, he didn't grow up in a Christian house, and he came and lived with us for a little bit when we were in Daytona, uh, Daytona Beach. But we were there probably two weeks, and it was our first time going into the main service. And uh, uh, Pastor Jim Rayleigh was preaching, and I was so excited that he was at church with me. I was so excited, and Pastor Rayleigh stood up and preached on tithes and offering and why you should give more. <laughs> And I was like, what is this? <laughs> like, I finally got him up in the church. Why would this happen? Why would this happen, right? And I'm sitting there, and I was like, I can't believe this. He's going to be like, they just want your money, Jordan. And I'm like, it's not it. It's not it. And I was, I was so worried about it the whole service. And then he gave an altar call, and he stood up and walked to the front and gave his heart to the Lord. On a, a tithes and offering message. Actually, I, re I remember Pastor Rayleigh being like, I really didn't expect y'all to come up here. Like, this is, <laughs> this is awesome. It's really good. But that's because the Lord does it. He's the one that works it out. And we just approach this with fear and trembling because we know who he is. And the fear and trembling is of him and focused on him. And a little bit of, you know what, I know that I can't do this. Please, Lord, help me. David is humble because he doesn't put it on his own shoulders. Joshua and Caleb were humble because they didn't put it on their own shoulders. The application of this in our life is pretty, pretty straightforward, pretty simple. And um, if, if you, Byron, if you would come up and play the keys or if someone else wants, I don't know. So, Romans 12, 16 says, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. And to not be wise in your own estimation. 
this is a very important part to me. I've said this before because a whole lot of times we, uh, and this isn't, I, I believe, Scripture talks about wisdom over and over and over, that it's more precious than gold, that it's something to be pursued. And so I truly believe in being wise in what you're doing. I am not saying that. And so don't, don't, don't think that when I say this. But a whole lot of times we use the term wisdom to hide our fear. We say, you know what, I'm just going to be wise in that rather than saying I'm not going to step out in faith because I'm not sure it's going to work out. A whole lot of times we say, you know what, I'm not, I'm, let, let's just use wisdom here. Let's just use wisdom. And it's a, tr it's a good thing. But I believe that you should, you should discern in your own life that you, um, actually, he says that in Romans 12, 3. Uh, Paul says that the way that we figure these things out is that we do an honest evaluation of ourselves and we ask the questions. That we sit there and we say, you know what, um, because, the, because of the privilege authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think that you are better than you really are. It says, be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith that God has given us. That uh, when stepping out in this, and I've I, I was hesitant about coming on this because it's a weird thing because I, again, I truly believe in wisdom, but I believe that there are some people that are using that, uh, that term, that word, that verbiage, that are using uh, biblical uh, processes to hide behind things that they shouldn't be hiding behind. Because in our walks, there is no place for fear. Because fear in, is an absence of, fear is the opposite of love, and it's an absence of faith in your life. That and we are called to be stretched. We are called to live by faith. We are called to use our faith to reach this community, to reach the people around us, to love on people, to be able to, uh, to, become, to, be able to become what the Lord has for, uh, wants you to be, to be able to speak out in the moments that he calls you to speak out. You have to be living by faith with your focus on the kingdom with this kingdom mindset, but you can't do it if you have fear in your life because it will stifle you at every turn. You can't be staring at the Lord and be fearful. It's not possible. It says by the level of faith that he has given you. You know what my level of faith is? It's the word of God. That's my level of faith. I believe that everything that is in the Bible is for you. I believe that what he will did for anyone in there, he will do it for you. He'll show up in a way that, um, that stifles everything. You say, I don't even know how that happened, how it worked out. I believe that everything is it. I mean, healing, I believe that's for you. Blessings, I believe that's for you. I believe that anything that you want to do that the Lord is already providing a way, he's just waiting for you to say, you know what, I'm going to do that. Because you called me to it. And I'm not going to allow fear to stifle me in any way. No matter what it is or what it looks like. So I just want to encourage you this week. As you're going forth, as you're going out, do an honest evaluation of yourself and say, you know what, I'm not going to be wise in my own eyes. I'm going to look at the Lord and see what he wants me to do. Because I believe that every day he wants you to do something, that he wants you to pursue something. He wants you to get something knocked off. He wants you to love on somebody around you. He wants you, I heard, I keep bringing Joe up, but Joe said uh, in a meeting the other day, he said that sheep are the ones who produce more sheep, that, that a shepherd can't do it. And I believe that's so true. I am called to speak to you guys. Pastor Nate is called to pastor you guys. And I believe that you're called to replicate sheep that you're called to go reach people, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, and we'll just encourage you here, and we'll be here for you and help you with your life. And when things go awry, you'll be able to turn to us and turn to the Lord, and that's great. But I believe that you're supposed to go out and do marvelous things right here in our city and in our community. Let me pray for you guys really quick. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity you've given me here today. I pray that if you're moving on someone's heart right now, that they would be sensitive to it. Lord, that, that they would know that the time to move on something is whenever you bring it up to them. Lord, I pray that you would just keep your presence resting in here and that people will be set free of whatever it is, no matter what it is, or they'll be encouraged or they'll be sent off, they'll, they'll whatever you have for them, Father. In Jesus' name. Joshua 1.9 says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. 
Do not be afraid or discouraged before the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. That's the biggest encouragement to me. I actually read it to Preston every single day. It's right above his bed. And he gets up and he goes, huh? I'm like, be strong and courageous. Do not be discouraged or afraid because the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And I want you to know that today. Uh, let me give, um, uh, if you just bow your head and close your eyes really quick. Uh, I want to speak to two different uh, groups of people here today. The first is you'd say, you know what, I haven't, uh, I haven't responded to an altar call in a while, or I haven't been to a church service in a while, or what, whatever it is, you'd say, you know what, you're talking about a whole lot of faith, and I don't feel like I'm living my life by faith. I don't feel like I'm living my life by the Spirit, and I want to change that because I want to do something for the Lord. I want to be His. You just slip up your hand really quick. You say, you know what, when you're praying for somebody, Pastor, pray for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The second group of people I want to talk to today I want, uh, is the people that say, you know what, I, I don't think that there's any, that I'm living by faith, but I don't believe that I'm all in on it all the way. I want to be more faith, I want to have more faith than I've ever had before. I want to step out sometime this week, not, not just sometime in the future, or I want to step, I want to see a time this week where the Lord uses me in a mighty way for him. That you're saying, this, I'm going to commit, this is making a commitment that this week you're going to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and you are going to be paying attention because he's going to give you something. He's going to give you an opportunity to reach somebody, to love on somebody, to do something that you don't usually do. Do you say you want to take that, make that commitment going forward? Would you just slip your, slip your hands up really quick? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All across the room. Lord, we thank you for who you are and we thank you that it's not on us and it's on you, Father. We thank you for uh, all the blessings that you continually give us and the fact that you paid the price and it's already won and we don't have to worry about it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, y'all uh, welcome uh, Pastor Nate to the front as we're closing out. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jordan. Wasn't that incredible? I'm so proud of him. Amen. He made a statement that really stuck with me. He was talking about David, and he said, you know, this is the difference between an earthly mindset and a kingdom mindset. Let me ask you, do you have an earthly mindset or do you have a kingdom mindset? Is God your friend? You know, the Bible says in, in Psalm 25, verse 14, it's just a short little verse, but it's so important. It says, the Lord confides in those who fear him. Say the word confide. It's an important word. What is the Lord trying to tell us today? You know, who do you confide in? You confide in a friend. And that's why some other translation says that the Lord is a friend to those who fear him. He confides in those to fear him. If you're going to have a heavenly mindset, you've got to become or have a relationship with God. You become his friend. You see what I'm saying? In every area of your life, if you have a relationship with the living God, he'll direct you, he'll guide you, He'll lead you. He will confide in you if you fear him, if you trust him, if you love him. In fact, this is what the Bible says. One of my favorite verses in Chronicles says that the eye of the Lord runs to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart his. Does God have your heart? Do you have a heavenly mindset? God's looking. He is eager to do a mighty work in your life. That's what Jordan was, was saying just a second ago, that as he began the message, he's talking about how God, uh, he steps out in faith, and, and God's been doing miracle after miracle after miracle. You know why God is, is blessing? Because he is stepping out in faith. He has, uh, his heart is toward God. And 
God's eye is looking for someone who will take a step of faith. Take a step of faith. Anybody can do nothing. God's not going to bless nothing. God's eye is looking for somebody who will do something. Even if it's crazy, if you'll step out in faith, as David did, as Moses, and say, look, it's not me. I love the message. It's God. He's got your back, church. And you may not think it, but he's got your back. He's waiting for his people to simply step out in faith. The Lord confides in those who love him. That's the alarm clock saying, I need to hurry up and finish. I get it. Amen. God is good. God is good. Lord, we love you. You're so good to us. Open our eyes that, Lord, you want to do so much in and through and around us that people see and say, wow, Lord, you're alive and living. You're moving in his life. I want you to move in my life. Hallelujah. God is good. God is good.